Let's talk about BL Heli and the options in BL Heli Suite. These are options that a lot of people have a lot of questions about. I'm going to take you through them and uh, help you make sense of them. Let's get into it. I'm not going to talk about in this video how to use BL Heli pass through. Okay, that's I am using BL Heli pass through in this uh, video. I have another video on how to do BL Heli pass through. I'm going to set that aside and I'm just going to focus on the options. But what I do want you to see is uh, look at all these options here. A whole bunch of these options are for the uh, helicopter version of BL Heli, and they don't apply to the multi rotor version of BL Heli. So you can see that when I hit read setup to read the values from my ESCs, a bunch of these options just go away. Come back. Oh, hang on. There we go. There we go. I didn't catch, I don't know why, but it didn't catch for a second the fact that I had four ESCs. So I had to hit the check button and remind it. So now that it's figured out that I have the multi-copter version of BL Heli on here, a bunch of these options have gone away. And I'm not going to talk about the helicopter-specific options because I'm pretty sure that 99.9% .9 of my audience is using the multi-rotor version. The next thing I want to show you is this. This menu option, under which is this, manuals, under which is the operation manual for BL Heli Scilabs Rev 14.x and frankly, all the way back to Rev2.x, if that's what you want to do. There are a lot of the questions that people ask on the BL Heli RC Groups thread are answered in here. Now, I'm not trying to say that this manual is the be-all, end-all. You should, you know, it's some of the language in here is still confusing if you don't already know what it's talking about. But definitely check that out because the answer to many of your questions are in there. But I'm going to explain it all to you in this video, so you don't need to do that if you don't want to. But it is there if someday you feel like reading it. I also want to point out to you this little option here, which for some reason, some of the questions are in here, or some of the documentation is in here, and some of it is here. All right, let's work our way through the options and talk about what they mean. We'll start with the PPM min and max throttle. That is the PPM timing value that the ESC is going to expect to see for zero and 100% throttle. And this is what you're calibrating when you do throttle calibration with clean flight or beta flight using the motors tab. You're telling the BL Heli ESC what its endpoints should be that it's going to expect to see coming from clean flight. Suffice it to say, uh, I do I have a whole lot more talking about this that I do in another video, but for now, that's that's just that. This calibrates the endpoints. You can see that the minimum value here is 1,000, and the maximum value here is 2020. If you run a calibration and you find that this value is 1,000 or that value is 2020, then you need to either raise min command or lower max throttle in clean flight. You never want to calibrate off the end of this scale. You always want to calibrate when you finish calibration, you see a little bit less than the max, or maybe even a lot less than the max, but you never want to finish the calibration and see these values at their max or min values, because that means you've calibrated off the end of the scale, and that's no good. The beacon delay and the beacon strength setting have to do with that thing your ESCs do where if you've disarmed the copter and the copter sits there for a while without throttling up, the ESCs will start beeping the motors. And the idea is that this can act as kind of like a lost model beeper. If you crash, you're disarmed, your copter is in the bushes somewhere, and you don't have a beeper, an actual beeper on your copter, the ESCs can start making the motors beep, and that can help you find the copter. You got to be careful with this because if your motors beep too long, and if your beacon strength is too high, you might think, oh, I'm going to turn my beacon strength all the way up, make my copter beep as loud as it can. If your beacon strength is too high, then your motors can overheat. Literally, you can smoke your motors from this beeping. So I've set my beacon delay to infinite. The beacon delay is how long the ESC will wait until it starts beeping from the moment that the copter is shut off. I've set it to infinite because I have a buzzer on my copter. It's switch activated. At any point when I crash, I can flip a switch and the buzzer will start, start beeping at me. So I'm not too worried about having my ESCs do it, especially when sometimes that may cause them to overheat. In, I think it was in BL Heli 14.5, they actually reduced the frequency of the beeping. So they beep, you know, slower, basically. And that was specifically because under some cases you could smoke motors. Definitely be careful about turning your beacon strength up. And if you have other means of doing it, there's better ways of getting a beep, a lost model beeper out of your copter than by having your ESCs do it. This is okay as a fallback. If you don't have a buzzer on your copter, it can save your butt if your copter is lost in the grass somewhere. The beep strength is how loud the ESC will beep during the initial startup tones. And if you're doing stick programming, the beeping will be then too. 
basically all the beeping that ESC does that isn't the lost model beacon. I don't see any reason really to change this from the default, but if you want it to beep louder, you can make it beep louder. Input polarity. It is very important that you leave this option alone unless you're absolutely sure that you need to change it. Normally, when the PPM value is at 1000, that's 0% throttle, and when the PPM value is at 2000, that's 100% throttle. Input polarity negative reverses that. In other words, when you lower the throttle all the way down to the bottom, the motor goes to 100%. That is not what you want under most conditions. But if you flip this option and your receiver or your flight controller is not outputting negative polarity, you will invert the throttle. So 100% is 0 and 0% 0 is 100. And you don't need a lot of imagination to figure out how that could turn into something bad. You see here that PPM center throttle is grayed out. And the reason for that is that I'm not in 3D mode. Notice that my motor direction can either be normal, reversed, or bidirectional. That's 3D mode, where you got a copter where the motors can reverse and can go upside down. If you've got bidirectional set, then the ESC also needs to know where the center point is, because that's going to be where the motors are at zero or idle, and then above that value is going to be motor spinning one direction, below that value is going to be motor spinning the other direction. Next, we'll talk about the PWM frequency. The PWM frequency can be low, high, or damped light. This refers to the frequency of the PWM signal that is output to the motors from the ESC. Low frequency is about 8 kHz, high frequency is around 20 kHz. You might think that high frequency is inherently better, but actually with low frequency there is a little bit of a reduced step to full power. What that means is that between like 99% power and 100% power, there's a little bit of a jump in the throttle curve and using low PWM frequency reduces that jump and makes for a smoother throttle curve at the top end. None of this really matters though, because if you are using ESCs that support damped light, you need to be using damped light. And damped light forces you to high frequency. Why is it? I don't know why it does it, but it does. Damped light is, is also known as active braking. It allows the ESC to actively slow the prop down when the throttle signal goes down, instead of just spinning and idling down from the drag of the air. And this is very good because it means that the props can spin down, not quite as fast, but maybe almost as fast as they can spin up. And that's very important because for every prop that spins up on a multi-rotor, some other prop is probably spinning down. And any lack of synchronization between them can result in destabilization of the copter. So damped light is very, very important for good flight characteristics, uh, for acro flight, for prop wash handling, etc., etc., etc. Damp light is so important. If your ESC supports damp light, you need to have damp light on. You want it on. There's really no downside to having it on. And even if there was a downside to having it on, it's so important to handling that the downside would probably be worth it. So run damp light. If it's there, choose it. That's the bottom line for this. Enable PWM input. Now, enable PWM input is off here, and you might think that's confusing because isn't the ESC using PWM input from the flight controller? Well, how do we turn that off? This is something completely different. This is actually referring to true pulse width modulation, which goes from 0% to 100% duty cycle, as opposed to the semi-PWM, PPM hybrid that we use in RC, which goes from 1,000 microseconds to 2,000 microseconds duty cycle. So some, uh, I think it's specifically brushed controllers, will output an actual 0 to 100% PWM signal. If you're working with a controller that outputs a, a, a real PWM signal, like a brushed motor, controller then you may need to turn this option on and the ESC will detect that and work correctly the rest of the time if you're not using that turning this off can prevent the ESC from being a little confused under some rare conditions where it accidentally thinks it's receiving a PWM signal but it really isn't basically if you're not using a brushed motor controller that outputs real PWM go ahead and turn this one off you may not run into trouble if it's turned on everything may still work correctly but there's no downside to turning it off so you may as well go ahead and do it. DMAG compensation. Let's talk about demagnetization and commutation. The ESC does a thing called commutation. Here's how I want you to think of commutation. You know those playground spinny whirly things that the kids ride on and the adult will stand by the side and spin it and the kid will ride on it and go round and round and round in circles, right? Okay. 
think of the ESC as the adult who is pushing the kid on the whirly spinny thing. And as the kid comes around, the adult grabs the rail and whoosh with the arm and swings the kid and spins the kid going faster. That's commutation. That is what the ESC is doing to the magnets as the magnets of the bell come past the pole. Okay, commutation means that through electrical and magnetic processes, the ESC causes the motor to suck the magnet towards the pole and then push the magnet past the pole. Okay, that's commutation. The timing of that is really critical. If you think about it, if the ESC is sucking the magnet towards the pole, and then the ESC starts pushing the magnet before the magnet has passed the pole, now the ESC will actually be pushing the magnet the wrong direction. So we need to pull when the magnet is coming towards the pole, let the magnet swing past the pole, and then push when the magnet is gone on by. Okay, the timing of that is really important. The ESC uses a thing called back EMF. Don't worry about what that is, but it uses a thing called back EMF to detect where the magnet is relative to the pole and figure out when it needs to switch from pulling to pushing. You got all that? Well, sometimes the back EMF doesn't work right and the ESC loses track of where the magnet is. And that's called a demagnetization event. When that happens, the other thing the ESC can do is it can say, oh my gosh, we got a demag situation. You know what? I'm just going to kind of keep working blind and do my best. And that's basically what demag compensation is, okay? But that hurts your performance. It hurts your, your uh, efficiency of your motor, okay? So you don't want to be doing that when you don't have to. But if you're getting these DMAG events, you want to be doing that because the alternative is that the motor stops working, right? So you want DMAG compensation as low as it can be. But if you're getting demagnetization events, then you can turn it up. How do you know if you're getting demagnetization events? Well, it's hard to tell. You know, it can look like a desync. It can, you can get the screeching, especially when you go from low throttle to high throttle. If the motor stutters or skips or screeches, you may need to turn DMAG up. Some motors are known to need higher DMAG. And if you look around for your motor, you may find people saying, oh yeah, you got to use high DMAG. Almost no motors should turn DMAG compensation off. You should almost always have it on low. And if you have DMAG events, especially when going from low throttle to high throttle very quickly, then you may need to turn it up to high. And that's DMAG compensation. That brings us to motor timing. I told you that the commutation process involves pulling the magnet towards the pole, letting the magnet pass the pole, and then pushing the magnet away from the pole. And there is a window of time where the magnet is passing the pole where nothing's going on. How big should that window be? How much time should we allow for the magnet to pass the pole? That is what the motor timing refers to. Now, the details of motor timing are a little bit arcane. At least they seem a little arcane to me when I read about them. It doesn't always make sense what high timing seems like it should be a shorter uh, window, zero window, but in fact it's longer and I don't know. The gist of it though is that higher KV motors often do better with higher timing. If you're on 2300 kV motors, you probably are going to be around medium timing, maybe medium high timing. If you're above about 2300 kV, chances are better that you're going to do better with medium high or maybe even high timing. And if you're below 2300 kV, chances are better that you might do better with maybe medium low or even low timing, especially the, the very high, very low kV big motors might do better with lower timing. The real factor that affects the timing is not the kv really it has to do with the motor construction and the type of metal used in the magnets and many other factors that are not easy to sum up so this kv is just a rule of thumb and i got the rule of thumb from quad mcfly ryan harrell and nobody knows more about escs than he does in my nobody i know knows more about escs than he does so if he says that's a useful rule of thumb go with it but don't just assume that because you're running a 2500 kv motor that you need high timing medium timing works pretty good for most of the motors that we're using with to run mini quads and and that's where i think most of my audience probably is Medium timing works pretty good even with larger motors, like, you know, like a 20, 20, uh, 2212 or something. Okay, so don't just assume you need a certain timing based on what motor you've got. 
What I did is I started with medium timing. Everyone should start with medium timing and get a feel for how smooth your motors sound. Get a feel for if you have desync events when you punch the throttle. Get a feel for how much current you pull at various throttle positions and then tweak the timing a little bit like go to medium high timing perhaps and see if the motor sounds smoother. I found for my 2600 kV RCX uh, 2205 motors, 2633 kV actually, I found that when I went from medium to medium high timing, the motors sounded smoother. I didn't have any desync problems or anything on medium timing, but I feel like they sounded smoother on medium high, and so I, I went with it. I didn't find that my current draw changed really at all. What you may find is that if you go, especially if you go to high timing, you may find that you get a lot more current draw, a lot less efficiency with actually not really any increase in power or any increase in motor smoothness. So don't don't just jump to high timing and assume it's going to be better. Only only really change the timing very carefully and if you really are trying to solve a problem as opposed to just changing it willy-nilly. If you want to be experimental, go ahead and tweak it. But do it in a in a structured manner. Don't just assume based on an ESC and a motor that you need a certain timing. Low RPM power protect. What this does is if the ESC is trying to spin the motor and the motor is not spinning, the ESC stops spinning the motor. In other words, if a prop is blocked by a branch, a low RPM power protect will shut the ESC down instead of letting it, you know, uh, light on fire. Okay. PWM output dither. This is a really confusing option to a lot of people who don't understand what it means. Let's say the ESC is receiving 1500 microseconds as its input throttle signal. Instead of outputting just 1500 microseconds to the motor, it will output a varying randomized value centered on 1500 microseconds, but it'll let a little bit of white noise in there. One of the things that this does is there can be harmonic resonances between the ESC and the motor at some throttle positions where you'll get like horrible vibrations or bad, bad rough sounds at specific throttle uh, positions. And if that happens, the output dither will reduce that and cause the throttle, instead of sitting right there at that one throttle position that causes the resonance, it'll sort of randomize it a little bit. The randomization should not be enough that you would notice it in the air, but it's enough that it smooths out that resonance a little bit. The other thing that dither does is it reduces that step to full throttle. From you know full throttle minus one to full throttle, it makes that step to full throttle smaller and makes the throttle curve a little smoother. So change output dither if you if you have uh, vibrations big vibration at one particular throttle position maybe try adjusting dither either higher or lower in some cases makes it better and the other thing is if you want to raise it it can reduce that step to full throttle temperature protection temperature protection if your ESC overheats it'll shut down now this only actually matters if your ESC has a temperature chip which not all ESCs do and if you've got a multi rotor Turn this off, because you'd rather have an ESC burn up than a copter drop out of the air. I don't know, I would. Go ahead, turn it on. If you want your ESC to shut down and go into limp mode when it's overheating, then that you turn this on. But I wouldn't turn it on for a multi-rotor, especially not a racing multi-rotor. You know, we should design the racing the multi-rotor so that the ESC is big enough to handle the power we're going to put through it. And if it overheats, that's a sign we need a bigger ESC or a smaller prop. And that's that's the temperature protection. Startup power is how hard the ESC will push the prop to start from a dead stop. So it takes an extra little bit of oomph to get the, the prop moving at first, and then once it's spinning, it's no problem. It keeps going. Startup power may need to be reduced if you have large motors with big, heavy props. And the reason is that if you're pushing a big, heavy prop to go, get going, get going, you can get such a surge of current that in some cases it'll even smoke the ESC or the motor. So with a big heavy motor and a big heavy prop, it may make sense to reduce the startup power. So it's like, look, let's just get you going there, buddy. Let's get you coasting. And then once it's going, it'll come to full power. For small props with small motors, I think it makes sense to have a higher startup power. Now, I, I haven't really researched this heavily. This is just what intuitively makes sense to me. And I could be wrong. I even think that having an increased startup power, I've seen ESG ship with a startup power of 75%. I like to change it to 100%. I don't know, why don't I change it to 125 or 150%? I don't know. 100% seems like a good number to me. It's a round number. I think that having this number raised a little bit from, from like 0.5 or 0.75 actually may allow you to uh, decrease your min throttle a little bit 
because it means that if the ESC stops, it will start going again more aggressively. But I don't know if that's true. I haven't tested that. Finally, we come to closed loop mode. Now, normally, when you feed a throttle signal into the ESC, that corresponds to a certain output power or PWM value that the ESC is going to output to the motor. But that does not correspond to any particular RPM. The prop is going to spin. So you put a smaller prop on, the motor will spin faster. You put a larger prop on, the motor will spin slower. You go to, to 3S versus 4S, it changes all that stuff, right? In closed loop mode, the ESC will associate the input signal with a particular RPM value. Now, this might at first sound like a good thing, but actually, I don't think it has a real benefit for multi-rotors. And the reason is that at the end of the day, you have the PID loop inside the flight controller that is controlling how fast the motor should be going. So if the motor needs to be going faster, the flight controller's PID loop will take care of spinning that motor up or spinning it down if it needs to go slower. And the actual RPM value, I don't care if the motor is going 10,000 RPM versus 12,000 RPM. All I care about is that it's going fast enough to make the thrust that the PID controller needs. Okay, so the only reason you would use closed loop mode, as far as I can see, is if you really needed the motors to move at a fixed speed. So for example, if you were trying to design a system where you had uh, two props, two airplanes, for example, and they were going to have a prop and you wanted them both to be spinning at exactly the same RPM, so they were pulling the same pitch speed in the air. I just made that example up. Well, you could use closed loop mode and then at a given throttle position, they would be moving at close to exactly the same RPM, or at least that's the way it's supposed to work. For multi-rotors though, closed loop mode is off, and in my opinion, it stays off. Next, we have motor gain, which is an increase or reduction in the output power of the motor. And we just leave that at one, but no need to increase or decrease that. Maybe hypothetically, you could imagine a scenario where if you're a beginner pilot and you have 4S batteries, but you don't quite feel up to 4S power, you could reduce your motor gain to 75% or something like that. And then you could have a little bit less power from your ESC. So you could adjust your throttle curve just the same. Either way. But for most of us, we're just going to leave this at one. And, and that's just that. I'm not sure what the benefit would be of increasing it. Since at the end of the day, full throttle is full throttle. So I think increasing this, it seems like that would just make you hit the top end sooner. It wouldn't magically turn your ESC up to 11 and give you more power that you didn't access before. But I don't 100% know about that. And I couldn't find any documentation of this in the BL Heli manual, so I couldn't tell you for 100% sure what exactly this does. Sorry about that. I'm going to show you one more option, and that is the programming by TX option. Now, you can actually program your ESC. You remember the old days when you put your throttle to full and the ESC would go into programming mode, and then you'd drop your throttle to select an option? Remember that? Oh, man, wasn't that a nightmare? Well, you can do that with BL Heli. Yes, you can, but you shouldn't because we have BL Heli Suite, and that's much better. So turn this option off when you're working with your ESCs because you don't want to accidentally enter programming mode somehow and screw up your ESC configuration. Turn it off. The only reason you turn this on is if you're going to do a throttle calibration using the Motors tab. You need this option to be on in order to do throttle calibration. And there's every so often somebody posts to the BL Heli group saying, my ESCs will not calibrate. What am I doing wrong? And it's that you've turned this option off. But turn it on, calibrate your ESCs, then turn it back off again and leave it off is my recommendation. All right. That is all of the options of BL Heli. And now you know what every single one of them does. And I hope, uh, I hope you now you're, you're a master of BL Heli. <laughs> If you've got any more questions, leave them down in the comments. And in the meantime, happy flying.